Heavenly Father, once again, we ask for your blessing upon the message. We pray that you would lead us into all the truth in Christ Jesus. Amen. Years ago, a seminary professor asked his class at the beginning of the semester that they would work together on one major project. And that project is they will go through the New Testament and note how many times each doctrine is mentioned. And their goal is to find the one doctrine, the one thing that is emphasized more than any other in the New Testament. When they completed the project, they were amazed to see that warnings against false teaching is the most mentioned doctrine or the thing that is emphasized more than any other in the New Testament, even more than love and unity. The letter of 2 Peter stands out as one of the most polemical writings in the New Testament. Here, Peter puts Christian heretics on trial. And in the message this morning, we're going to look at three aspects of false teachers, their rise and presence in the church, their danger and destruction, and finally, God's inevitable judgment on them. To set, th- to set things in context, Peter's main purpose in writing this letter is to encourage believers to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. How do we do that? Well, we grow by availing ourselves to the power and promises of God, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. We grow, by, we grow in the Christian virtues that Peter lays out for us in verses 5 to 11. And we also grow by remembering the glory of Christ as revealed in history and in the scriptures, verses 12 to 21 in chapter 1. If chapter 1 presents us with positive ways of Christian growth, then chapter 2 adds an extra dimension from a negative perspective that we also grow by refuting false teachers and their doctrines. As Peter begins with the word but in chapter 2, there's a transition of tone, of speaking. Uh, Peter uh, changes from uh, a loving encourager to a stern rebuker. He brings us from the holy mountain down to the deep abyss of false teaching and false teachers. In chapter 2, we find one of the most solemn and strong warnings against false teachers. And we get a sense of the importance of truth so that we might stand against every attempt that tries to defile the purity of the word of God. Now, first of all, Peter predicts the rise and presence of false teachers among God's people, and we can find in verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. Two lessons we can learn. First, the greatest threat to God's people oftentimes does not come from the outside, but from within. Of course, we're not talking about God's people in terms of God's elect, for we know that no one chosen by God can ever be lost. But we're speaking of people who profess faith, who claim to be Christians, but deny its power and godliness, people who were never saved in the first place. Do you remember when Paul departed Ephesus? Uh, He gathered the elders and he said to them, From among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. And Jesus also said, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness." The church is beset with danger, not only from uh, persecution from the outside, but also from within. The second lesson is that Christian heretics have always been with the church in every age and generation. 
Now, Peter does not identify who these false teachers are, but simply indicating the reality of their presence. We see this pattern in Scripture, that wherever the seed of truth is planted, the devil also plants the seed of error, beginning in the garden when God commanded Adam not to eat the fruit from the tree. The devil comes uh, to Eve with a falsified version of God's command. And throughout Old Testament history, uh, we see that the devil uh, contaminates the word of God. The devil manipulates the word of God through his mercenaries and false prophets uh, to speak lies to the people. We think of Elijah versus the prophets of Baal. Think of Micaiah versus the 400 men. Jeremiah versus Hananiah. And even in Jesus' day, we see that the Jewish leadership was corrupt through and through, with the Pharisees uh, representing the height of false religion. Just read Matthew 23, and you will get a sense of their hypocrisy. Now, this illustrates uh, what Jesus meant when he spoke the parable of the wheat and tares. Do you remember that parable? Uh, wheat and tares will grow together in the same field. And in the meantime, God allows uh, his sheep and the goats to coexist in the visible church until that day when he will separate them from one another in the final judgment. So the teaching of Scripture is clear. False teachers will arise in the church as they have been always present with us throughout history. For that reason, we should not be surprised when we see them around. The question is, how do we know? Uh, how do we, are there signs and characteristics that we can look out for when they are here so that we can mark them out or avoid them, uh, not associate with their danger? In the next section, Peter describes them in more detail and warns God's people of their danger and destruction. He gives us five reasons why they are dangerous. First, they operate in a devious manner. Verse 1 continues saying, Who, that is, false teachers, will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Notice the word secretly. In other words, they will smuggle in their ideas and opinions. They never deal in honest and straightforward ways. Uh, as Jude says, they creep into the church unnoticed, uh, like a snake. Uh, they, they, they crawl into the church and uh, spitting poisonous doctrines to lead people astray. Now, they would not openly oppose the truth, that would make them very apparent, but oftentimes they, they will say to us, I'm just like you. Our, we are more alike than we differ. Uh, but as we know, the scripture says that the devil often transforms into an angel of light, and so are his underlings. Second reason, they're dangerous because they have committed a serious error. Peter says that their heresies are so destructive, even to the point of denying the Lord who bought them. You see, no error is more serious than denying the absolute and supreme lordship of Christ, especially for those who claim to be his people. Now, we can say that their denial was not only theological, but also involves a licentious lifestyle that were not in accord with the faith that they profess. And what will be their final outcome? Peter says, swift destruction. You see, the false teachers and those who buy into their teaching will find their way on eternal damnation. Third reason is because they 
attract a large following. Look at verse 2. It says, And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Now, do you remember Jesus' words? Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, why is it that false teachers are so popular and that they are so successful? Seemingly, uh, it's because they tell people what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. They tailor their message uh, to the likings of sinners and not according to the word of God. And so they attract a large following and they entice unstable people to believe strange doctrines. The fourth reason why false teachers are dangerous is because they make a disastrous impact. Peter says in verse 2, because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. The way of truth refers to the truth of the gospel preached by the apostles. We read in the book of Acts that Christians were uh, called the followers of the way. And when false teachers profess Christ as Lord and yet live immoral lives, they bring a bad name to Christ. They bring a bad reputation to the Lord Jesus. And that's how the way of truth were blasphemed. And people would look at their lives, uh, even today, and say, if that's Christianity, I want to have nothing to do with it. If that's how a pastor lives, I never want to become a Christian. This is unfortunate when outsiders cannot distinguish between good shepherds and false teachers that reject the whole way of truth and throw out the entire package of the Christian faith. Now, a final reason why they're dangerous is that they're motivated by greed. Verse 3, by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Now, later, Peter will say that they have a heart trained in covetous practices. Uh, in other words, they are experts in greed, like Balaam, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. You see, the ultimate driving force behind the false teachers uh, is not the false teaching itself, but an unbridled love for money. And in order to deepen their own pockets, they would fabricate stories. They make up uh, stories that are untrue. Here the word um, deceptive could also mean uh, made up, referring to being mentally constructed without a basis in fact. They tell you stories uh, which Peter says they were cunningly devised fables. They cheat you and they do not love you and they will bring you to eternal damnation and hell if you follow their ways because they were motivated by greed. But they shouldn't be enamored by their short-lived success because God is ever awake for judgment. It says, for a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. You see, God knows. God is truth. God is the judge of all the earth and he is ready to do justice, not just to the false teachers, but to all who oppose the truth of the gospel to all who falsify his word and oppose the lordship of Christ. Now, so far in this sermon, uh, Peter has predicted the rise and presence of false teachers. There will be, uh, they will arise in the church, and as God's people, we must be prepared. And we can also know them by uh, certain signs their devious manner, serious error, deceptive appeal, disastrous impact, and base motive. These signs help us 
identify them and guard ourselves from error. Now, in the next section, we're going to look at how God will respond to this ever-present danger in the church. From verses 4 to 10, Peter is going to lay out for us uh, a rationale for God's judgment, uh, a, a warrant for God's judgment. He's going to assure God's people that judgment will come, that justice will be done, even though it may seem to be delayed. In terms of structure, this passage constitutes one thought unit. There is a long conditional sentence that runs from verse 4 all the way to verse 8. Uh, you see the uh, protasis, the if clause uh, at the beginning of verse 4. But you don't see the then clause until verse 9, uh, which is also the thesis of this entire passage, uh, which says that the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. You see, here lies the believer's comfort, encouragement, and hope. And it's simply this, the Lord knows. The Lord knows whom to save and whom to judge. The Lord knows how to save and how to judge. The Lord knows what he is doing. The Lord knows where he is going, and he knows what is the best way to get there. You see, he does everything according to his perfect justice and divine knowledge. To illustrate this principle, Peter cites three examples from the Old Testament. The first is the example of fallen angels. Verse 4, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them to, down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Scholars debate on the exact reference of this verse, uh, but it's likely that Peter is thinking of Genesis 6. Jude also sheds light on the nature of this angelic fall. He says, that the angels did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. Now, if that's the case, then we have all three examples uh, found in Genesis in a chronological order. So the angelic fall in Genesis 6, uh, the flood narrative immediately following after that, and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. Now, going back to Genesis 6, the specific sin was that uh, the angels of God, uh, that, that is the sons of God, uh, marrying the daughters of men. So they committed uh, sexual sins by marrying the daughters of men. Now, God had judged them by sending them to hell. The word hell is not the usual word, but Tartarus uh, only occurs once in the New Testament. It's simply uh, being borrowed from Greek mythology means the, uh, sub sub uh, uh, the lower parts of the underworld in which demons and divine, uh, divine beings are being imprisoned. Now, it's important to know that this is not the place of final punishment, but it's simply a way of saying that these angels are bound and kept by God for the day of final judgment. Peter's argument here is from the greater to the less. You see, if God did not spare the angels, uh, who are much greater uh, than the false teachers in power and in might, then God certainly will not spare the false teachers. Second example, taken from the flood narrative, verse 5. And if God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bring in the flood on the world of the ungodly. You see, just as God did not spare the angels who sinned, he did not spare the ancient world either. 
because as we read in Scripture, human wickedness was great in the sight of God. Every thought and intent of people's heart was only evil continually. But what is added in this example is that in the wrath of God, he remembered mercy to Noah and his family. When we see this example, compared to the first example, uh, is that grace was not reserved for angels, but grace was reserved for human beings. The author of Hebrews makes this clear, that God does not give aid to angels, but he gives aid to the seed of Abraham, that is, his believers. Um, Christ came as a man. He did not come as an angel. He assumed human flesh. Uh, he bore our sins on the cross uh, for sinners, not for angels. Through his death, that he might save us from sin and release us from the power of death. Once again, the point being made here is that God knows how to save the righteous and how to condemn the wicked. Third example comes from the famous story of, the, uh, of Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to read to you very quickly from verse 6 to verse 8. He says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example uh, to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man, dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. God also remembered Lot in time, in a time of judgment. God also showed mercy in a time of wrath. God is a God who knows what he is doing. He will never forget his people in a time of judgment. Uh, he will also sh always show mercy uh, to his people in his dealings with sinners. You see, while he executes judgment on the wicked, he will show his grace uh, to those who are his. I'm not going to go into details of Lot's example. I think there are lots of lessons we could learn, uh, both from the judgment itself and from the example of Lot uh, set for us uh, in knowing how to live a godly life in an ungodly world. But I want to um, just put these examples together, and, and I want to show you that what Peter is doing is that he is building a cumulative case for the judgment of God. What we learn from the first example is that the judgment of God is inevitable. You see, even angels cannot escape the judgment of God. Uh, no one is exempt from the judgment. But in the example of Noah, we learn that God's inevitable judgment can be escaped, that there is a way out, and it's by faith in the promise of God and in the free offer of the gospel. The third example teaches us that God's judgment in the past serves as a warning for people who live ungodly lives in the present. All of these examples point to God as the righteous judge of all the earth, but also as the gracious savior of his people. Dear brothers and sisters, can you relate to Noah and to Lot? We know that we live in a world that is not much different from the ancient world. We live in a city, Toronto, that is not much different from the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Believers can take comfort in the fact that God is still in the driver's seat and he knows what 
he is doing, just like he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, just as, as he judged uh, the ancient world by water. He knows how to judge the present world, and he knows how to uh, save and deliver his people from their trials and temptations. He knows how to uh, execute justice in each and every situation. He knows how to uh, humble the proud and strengthen the weak. And in your situation, in your particular situation, he knows how to get you out. And even he does not deliver you out of that circumstance, he knows how to carry you through. He knows how to give you strength. He knows how to give you his promises so that you can stand on them and keep hoping and keep believing and keep grasping on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he knows how to meet out every inch of judgment on the wicked, on the evil ones, and on the false teachers. And from, he knows that he, how to preserve his people from every harm. So, dear friends, always remember, the Lord knows, and that is enough. In this sermon, we have considered the rise and presence of false teachers, the danger and destruction of false teachers, and God's inevitable judgment on the false teachers. Now, application. How can we apply it to our lives? Let me suggest a few. Now, first of all, the rise and presence of false teachers can teach us to stand for the truth. After all, Jude also exhorts us to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered to us. Now, standing for the truth is always easier said than done. And it's not easy, particularly in the 21st century, for Christians today face peculiar challenges uh, of our age. First, there is the challenge of postmodernism. You see, our generation is permeated with an air of suspicion, of absolute truth, of universal truth. You see, truth has become subjective and relativized. Uh, what is true for you may not be true for me. Uh, what may be your interpretation may not be my perception. There is no such thing as a clear line or a clear standard by which we measure what is right and what is wrong. Everything is just interpretation. You see, skepticism is what characterizes uh, the intellectual stance of our age. Instead of pursuing the truth, we're told to beware of truth. We're told to distrust any voice that tells you that is the way. Uh, we're told to not to impose our beliefs on other people. Uh, how dare you to impose your morality and your beliefs on me? On what basis do you do that? And as a result, it has become increasingly difficult for Christians to witness. Uh, it becomes very uncomfortable even for us to uh, take a stand for the truth, especially in academic environments, universities, or institutions. And so many Christians take a utilitarian approach. Going to church has really helped my family. Uh, believing in Jesus has helped me to find a job or has helped my health. Uh, my faith in Christ has helped me get out my, of my depression and anxiety. I mean, these things are true and useful, but they tend to shift our defense of Christianity on the basis of practicality and not on the basis of its truthfulness. And the direct result of that is that people uh, are less concerned about the truth. But nevertheless, we must draw a line. Uh, we must truth the side of truth. We must tell people that there is truth in the world. After all, 
unbelief and ignorance of the truth does not invalidate its truthfulness. You see, truth stands no matter what people say or how people respond. Truth stands in spite of false teachers' uh, manipulation, uh, their attempt to distort and falsify the truth. You see, the truth is absolute. It is universal. It does not change over time. And what is this truth? It is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. For he is the only way to the Father, not one among many others. You see, we must tell people that Christ is truth and Christ is the only way and that all other variations of the truth, all other uh, fake Christs or false teachers do not lead people to salvation. We must continue to tell people of Christ's saving grace and not to do it in a rash and offensive manner, but to do it with gentleness and wisdom. A second application. The danger of destruction of false teachers should cause us to know the truth better. Uh, the question is not whether false teachers will arise. It will. They will. Uh, but the question is, how do we know that we are well prepared to meet them on the battleground? Uh, what are some things that we could do better to prepare ourselves? Let me suggest two things. First, we need to cultivate a critical faculty without a critical spirit. Now, false teachings come to us in various forms. Some of them are outright rejections of Christ. Uh, others are uh, more subtle in nature and are less discernible. And it is the, the latter category that are often more dangerous. The devil has a large wardrobe, and in that wardrobe, he has garments of many colors. He can dress like pastors and preachers, uh, TV evangelists, theologians, scholars, seminary professors. What it means for us is that we must be prepared. We must be, first of all, critical of what we read and of what we hear. Uh, it means we must not swallow everything that a person says or even a scholar says on certain issues. For example, many commentaries on Second Peter do not believe Peter wrote the letter. Uh, even conservative scholars and seminary professors are not immune to error. You see, we must be critical of our intake of information. But on the other hand, it does not mean that we should go for a heresy hunt, uh, that we become, uh, we are always looking for fights, becoming ultra sensitive to every nuance of theological differences. You see, we must have that uh, balance and be judicious. We must not be too quick or too eager to brand people who differ with us as heretics. And to do that, we need to cultivate a critical faculty without a critical spirit. But how do we cultivate a critical faculty? Uh, it leads to my second point, and it is this. We need to distinguish between what is essential and what is not. If we are to apply Peter's teaching, uh, we need to have some kind of idea of what doctrine or what teaching Peter has in mind. Clearly, he is not talking about every doctrinal issue or every moral failure, but he's talking about teachings that have eternal consequences uh, that clearly contradict what the New Testament says that Christians are to believe and to do. Now, on this point, uh, Douglas Moo, a New Testament scholar, offers helpful insights. He says that balance is the key. On the one hand, we must not lump every detail of doctrine uh, on the essentials. On, on this example, we think about people, Christians, who 
um, insist that everyone must read the same version of the Bible or believe exactly the same things that how future events will unfold. But on the other hand, we must not have complete tolerance on every issue on the Christian faith. We think about certain ecumenical movements uh, that have erred in this direction. They compromise the truth and reduce the Christian faith to nothing more than a, a vague reverence for God. So how do we achieve that balance? The answer is simple, but not always easy to put into practice. We need to determine what Scripture deems essential. And to do that, we need to know the, what the whole counsel of God uh, speaks on a certain topic and not base our judgments on one or two texts taken out of their contexts, but we must know what the entire Bible says on a topic. And once we have determined which hills we are willing to die on, then we need to allow disagreements, allow differences on the non-essentials. We need to leave room for them, and we need to learn to live with each other out of love uh, and unity. There was a famous line that says, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. I pray that this would be true in Jarvis, that in spite of our differences, we could still learn to live with one another in unity, liberty, and charity. So what must we do in light of Peter's teaching? Uh, we must stand for the truth, we must know the truth, and finally, we must rest in the truth. You see, God's inevitable judgment teaches us that we must rest in His divine omniscience. You and I must entrust ourselves into the hands of an all-knowing God. When we look around and see the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer, are we not tempted to question the goodness and wisdom of God? And when we see false teachers gaining success, uh, attract large crowds, making a good living of themselves, and garnering great success, are we not stirred in the spirit seeing the truth being profaned? Uh, are we not like Habakkuk who cried out to the Lord, How long, O Lord, will you keep silent? at the apparent injustice and oppression being done to your people. I want to speak to the lots and the Noahs of our day. You may be oppressed at the sins around you. You may be stirred by uh, the truth of God being twisted, being uh, manipulated around you. But I want to rem remind you that, that God is not silent that God is not out of his control, that he knows what he is doing, that his ways that are higher than our ways, his thoughts higher than our thoughts. Even though Satan uses false teachers to attack the church, God uses the same means to purify our dross and to ensure that in the end we will stand true and faithful until we see him face to face. You see, we are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, says Peter. This is why the church has always been plagued by heresies, but has always come out stronger and better than before. You see, it's not, it's not that we are strong in and of ourselves. It's because Christ is strong. It's because we're standing on Christ the rock and depending on His preserving grace. So today, God invites you to trust and rest in His divine wisdom and in His perfect knowledge. Are you willing to trust Him to the end? Are you willing 
to rest your life, uh, to rest your anxieties, to rest at the results of your life that, that seem disappointing into His hand, knowing that He's always good, He's always right, He will always see justice prevail. And at the end of the day, He knows better than we do. And finally, my friend, are you on a journey of intellectual pursuit? Are you on a quest to search for the meaning of life? Is there an inner voice that keeps saying to you, there's got to be truth somewhere in this world, and I need to find the truth? Well, let me tell you, I think that God is also inviting you to rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for your sins. My friend, your search for meaning, your search for truth can stop at the foot of the cross. Because on the cross, you will see truth displayed. Uh, You will see the truth being embodied in a person. Uh, You will see the truth of God's wrath being poured out uh, on sinners. You will see the truth of God's love for sinners. And you will see the truth of God's justice being satisfied in the death of His Son. Yes, God did not spare the ancient world. He did not spare the sinning angels. He did not spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But I want you to tell you that He did not spare His Son. But He gave Himself up for us so that those of us who deserve His punishment and wrath can now find rest. We can now find forgiveness of sins, that we can now receive the truth of God, the gospel of grace, free. All that is required of you is to come to Christ by faith and to surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and to claim salvation for your souls today. And if you are willing to do that, God will open your eyes to see the truth. If you're willing to do that, He will save you now and He will set you free from your sins. As I close, I want to leave you with these questions. Are you standing for the truth? Are you preparing yourself in knowing the truth? And are you resting in that truth? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the truth that we have received in Jesus Christ. Our hearts are stirred because we see around us that truth being twisted, being manipulated, being falsified in millions of ways. But yet, the more falsified versions are there of truth, the more we are convinced that truth stands. And we thank you that you have saved us, you have opened our eyes, and you have delivered us from false teaching. And we trust that you will preserve us to the end, that you will see us through in a world of falsehood, in a world where lies prevail, in a world where the God of lies, the Father of lies, has, in, has controlled many peoples. And we pray that you would set people free from their bondage to lies. We pray that you would set people free from their sins. We pray that you would break the chain and that you would shine the light and that you would lead your people triumphant until we see you face to face, until we see justice being done because we know that Jesus reigns today and that he will reign forevermore. We pray in his name. Amen.